to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. So in today's episode, we are going to revisit a career field that we've talked about before, but in far more detail, and specifically the career field being the 13 Bravo Air Battle Manager, and we're going to do it in two parts. The interview today is with Major Jason Hollywood Spicer, and in this first episode, we're going to focus our time and attention on undergraduate Air Battle Manager training, or UABMT. Yeah. And then next week, we're going to have a follow up to today's episode, which will be a continuation of the interview with Major Spicer. The goal here is to help you, the audience, get a deeper understanding of this very small but very important career field of being an air battle manager and being responsible for the control of aircraft as they conduct operations in the Air Force. Yeah. I love, you know, that we go through this career field again because. It just reminds me of how vast and broad the opportunities and experiences that are available as a member of the Department of Defense and the Air Force in particular. You know, there was a guy that I went to church with in Hawaii who did pest control for the Air Force. Yeah. But that included like keeping birds away from airfields mm -hmm. and taking care of deer that had wandered onto the airfield and wild hogs that had wandered onto airfields. Like this was his job. And I just remember thinking, what, what? How, how does this, you know, I mean, it makes sense, right? Yeah. We got to keep these planes safe from foreign objects and things, but there's just so much opportunity. And in particular, air battle management, it's not like there's a whole lot of that going on elsewhere. Right. I mean, maybe air traffic control, maybe, but not a whole lot of air traffic controllers are like telling other aircraft how to go blow up things. You know, they're just exclusively trying to avoid that. And, you know, so yeah. it's just a, a pretty different thing. So I, I really liked Hollywood's explanation. I think our audience is going to benefit from it. Yeah. So like I said, this episode, it concentrates primarily on UABMT, where Hollywood is currently the assistant director of operations for the flying training unit at Tyndall Air Force Base. So he's intimately familiar with how UABMT is organized and provides a great amount of detail for all of you in this episode. So let's go ahead and cut over there to Major Jason Hollywood Spicer. Major Jason Spicer, welcome to the show. We're so excited to have you. And hey, thanks for taking the time to reach out to me and make the proposition that this was something that you wanted to do. So I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. But I have to ask, you know, what was some of the motivation? What led you to finally write that email and say, man, I got I to gotta get in on this? So I was kind of twofold. One, I really appreciate what you and Reed are doing. Like, I think it's really cool. One of the big things that I think keeps people from joining, at least on the officer side, they're just like, oh, I'll just go enlist, is they don't know the process. They're intimidated by it. They're like, oh, four years of school or four years of the academy or, you know, what are they, 60-day wonders now at, at OTS? So at least, yeah, something like that. So it's kind of intimidating, but I think that you beat that through information. And listening to a lot of your podcasts and, and seeing like, I was learning a lot of stuff I didn't know, despite being in almost, you know, 12 years and learning things about other AFSCs. I was like, oh, that's really cool. I, I actually didn't know that. Right. So, and there's, there's massively different aspects to the Air Force when you're ops versus non-ops or your maintenance or your, you know, engineering, right. Or so many different aspects to the Air Force. The more we learn about how other people do their job in the Air Force, the better we are at ours. Yeah. So there was that aspect. And then nobody has any idea what an air battle manager does. And uh, I kind of wanted to get it out there. And, you know, being at the FTU, now is a perfect time to explain it to people and tell them what they're in for. Yeah, that's really awesome. So why don't we 
just take a couple steps back and give you the opportunity to introduce yourself a little bit. You know, say, who is Jason Spicer? How did he discover the Air Force and decide that going into the Air Force is actually the thing that you wanted to do? And uh, before you do all that, I have to say one thing. We were in ROTC together uh -huh. at BYU. Correct. Detachment 855. And there are two things that I remember about you. Oh, gosh. During that time. It's not bad. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that I remember about you is you were a part of the field training prep staff while I was going through it. So you had the responsibility of preparing me for field training and all of the fun antics that went along with that. And I have this very distinct memory of you talking about a snake pit while you were at field training. Mm. And oh yes. And that like, you know, set my hair on end. Like and I was expecting a snake pit every corner that I turned while I was at field training. And it was because of how you explained it. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's awesome. Uh. So then the second thing that I remember about you is that as long as I can remember, you were always talking about wanting to be an air battle manager. And I don't know if that was actually the case, if you had always wanted to do that. And we'll get into that you know, here in a little bit, I'm sure. But that's what I remember about Cadet Jason Spicer at, at Brigham Young University, Detachment 855, is that he was going to be an air battle manager. <laughs> that's funny. Um, yeah, it's interesting. That was really the only thing that I was interested in doing in the Air Force. And it's not that I knew what it was, but I knew what it wasn't. Okay. So I definitely wanted to fly. I enjoy, you know, being on aircraft and things like that. However, with my eyesight, I knew I could potentially get a pilot slot, but I also had this distinct feeling that the Air Force would suck the fun out of flying if I did it as a pilot. Okay. Uh, to me, navigators, I didn't know much about CISOs or anything. They actually have a really cool job, some of which I learned from your podcast. But I have a lot of friends that are, you know, sizzos and wizzos and things like that. And they have a pretty cool job. But like my idea of a traditional navigator was why isn't a robot doing this already? And math. Right. And so I wasn't interested in that. And so really the only rated slot left was an air battle manager. And I remember looking it up on, you know, ROTC.com or something like that. And I didn't understand a word of the description <laughs> and what it was say was like, oh, you're going to work with data links and you're going to do all this random stuff. And I, I had no idea what it was. And nobody could tell me. And I was like, well, I guess, you know, sounds, sounds interesting. The name sounds cool. So why not? And here you are, an air battle manager 12 years later. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so yeah. walk us through how you got to this point. You know, what turned you on to the Air Force? What was the developmental path that led you to BYU and ROTC? And uh, yeah, just take it from there. Sure. Yeah. So I mostly grew up out West. I was born like in New Hampshire, lived in Washington state, but when I was young, probably four years old, we moved to Southern rural Idaho. And I grew up, you know, in the backwoods of rural Idaho and had, you know, not a care in the world. And then my dad, crazy man that he is, joined the army at 32 years old. Now I have a picture of him at 32 and he looks about 15 or 16. He's very young looking, but either way, joining a military branch at the age of 32 is pretty intense. And he enlisted. Okay. He enlisted in the army. Uh, he went to basic, he went to airborne, AIT, all that good stuff. So he was gone for a good chunk of time. It was, I think it was at least six or seven months, maybe nine months. And I remember him coming home, seeing him in uniform. And I thought it was really cool that he was, you know, serving his country. He did reserve time. So he was in the army reserve for 12 years. And then he swapped over to the air force for his last eight and then eventually retired from that at 20. So he did 20 years and then got out of the reserves. And I remember when September 11th happened, I was in high school, it was my senior year, and I turned 18 like two weeks later. And I remember I was still 17 and I walked into the Marine recruiter's office and I was like, <laughs> I wanna go knock in doors. You know, I had some ground and pound in me and I was really interested in just contributing back. I really, really felt like genuinely blessed to be in the US and have the you know, all of the wonderful things that we had. And I wanted to give back. And I figured, you know, I'd, I'd do a tour, do four years, maybe deploy overseas once or twice. And the Marine recruiter was like, hey, uh, you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, right? I was like, well, yeah. He goes, are you planning on going on one of those two-year service missions? 
I was like, well, yeah. And he goes, do yourself a favor, go on that first. And when you come back, I promise this war is still going to be here. And I'm like, but no, man, that's like <laughs> years away. I can't do that. The war is going to be over. Uh, you know, and I want to contribute. So I went to talk to my dad and uh, I <laughs> really respect my father. And he smacked me upside the head and he's like, look, God bless the Marines because, you know, we need them. But they're few and proud because so many of them get killed. And, uh, you know, <laughs> if, if you're, if you're going to go into the military, join the Air Force. And if you're going to do it smart, at least go the officer route, go get a degree. Go do your mission, come back, do a degree. And I'm sitting here going, I'm doing the math in my head. I'm like, man, that's a long time. That's like eight years before I'd be putting on bars. Right. But it kind of resonated with me. And uh, I figured that was probably the wise way to go. And then I had this grandiose plan of I would go do four years in the Air Force. I was going to go to film school. And naively, I thought the Air Force would pay for film school. And then I'd go <laughs> do four years in the Air Force. And I'd be like, oh, school is completely paid for. This is great. I did four years as an officer and I punch. And uh, so I had kind of had a little bit of misinformation or misunderstanding of how the process worked, but I didn't really have any way to get to school. Uh, BYU is not an easy place to get into. Right. And I had the bare minimum. I think I had like a three, six GPA and a 25 on the ACT. And that is the bare minimum to get into BYU. And I had friends that had like a lot better qualification than I did and they didn't get in. So I didn't want to apply to BYU. <sighs> So I went and interviewed at like the U, uh, Utah State, and none of them had the detachment that I was looking for. And so, man, I called up BYU after the deadline. I was like, hey, if I have a scholarship, could I come here? Because, you know, I'd really like to go to your debt. Because what I had done is I had done the research. And even though I was 21 years old, I still qualified for a high school scholarship through ROTC because I had not gone to any college. So I competed for it. I got a scholarship and I called up BYU that day and was like, hey, can I put in? It was past the deadline to apply. And the commandant of cadets at the time, Captain Walker, super cool guy, uh, was like, let me call you back. He called me back 10 minutes later. He's like, you get your application in today and they'll accept it. So I put it in and I got my acceptance letter to BYU like two weeks before any of my friends did that applied. So that's how I ended up getting into BYU, scraped under the bar and... Uh, and dove in head first to ROTC. Okay, I'm going to pause you right there because I just want to clear this up, make sure that everybody who's listening to this understands exactly what happened. So you applied for an Air Force ROTC scholarship to go someplace else, right? I put in for a scholarship of any kind. Okay. Like I submitted my information. I did a PT test. I did all that stuff and said, I'll take whatever you can give me. Okay. So you had the intention of you wanted the Air Force scholarship, and you would have taken that to any school that would have taken you, right? Yes. But then you were able to use that, the fact that you got an Air Force ROTC scholarship to get into a school that you wouldn't have gotten into otherwise. Correct. That is a great way to put it. And the funny thing is, it was, I was contracted under computer science. I'd, I've never done computer science. <laughs> I had no idea, right? Like, I'm like, oh, I can learn that. I'll go to school and they'll teach me. Little did I know. First day, I show up to C++ and they're like, if you don't know how to program already, you are going to fail this class. <laughs> I was freaking out. I'm less than a week into my first semester of college. I'm freaking out because I'm like, I went to, gosh, calculus and I hadn't done a math class in five years. I mean, I got A's in all my math classes, man, but I'd never done calc and I was struggling. And so I was like, I look up all the regulations and it says, hey, your first year is basically a freebie, right? On scholarship. Yeah. You can take whatever you want. As long as you can prove it's towards your degree that you were under contract for, then you're good. And so I was like, I, I'm taking electives my entire first year. <laughs> <laughs> and then I voluntarily dropped my scholarship and recompeted for it again, midway into my FTP year, my second year. Yeah. And got it. So I got really lucky twice. <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and then the other thing that I wanted to touch on here is what type of scholarship did you get? So I'm trying to remember the actual specifics. All I really know is that it was enough that it covered, it was basically a full ride. It wasn't their highest tier, right? And I'm sure you probably know the tiers better than I do, but it was enough to cover literally every penny that it was going to cost me to go to BYU, including all my books and everything. So I essentially picked up a full ride. Now that was in part because BYU was so inexpensive yeah. in comparison to other schools. Right. Yeah. That's kind of what I was wondering is, was it that you 
picked up a type one full ride scholarship that could have taken you anywhere and you could have done the same thing, you know, for Harvard or MIT or whatever, you know, or was it that you got the type two scholarship that is also transferable across state lines and is enough to pay full tuition at BYU, but doesn't at pretty much any other Ivy League type school? I think it was type two. I'm fairly certain it was the latter because they don't give out many of the type ones, if I recall correctly. They don't give out many of the type ones. It's super competitive, especially now. I can't say what it was back 17 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was yeah, pretty, pretty much. It was 2004, actually. Okay, so a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, is that you were able to use the fact that you had a scholarship school already paid for it as leverage to get into the school of your choice absolutely and that is incredible and is not how things are done now <laughs> <laughs> that does not surprise me i think captain walker hooked me up pretty well yeah so uh lucky you uh, for that's how you know things went at the time it certainly doesn't happen like that now at least i never saw it happen like that while i was cadre at the detachment but it may be possible that there are other universities that are willing to take Air Force RTC scholarships and use that as a way to get into the, uh, into the school. Interesting. That is super cool. Fascinating story. Thank you for sharing it with us. Glad that you were able to get into Brigham Young University. Glad that you were able to be there at Detachment 855 to yell at me when I was screwing up. <laughs> So, I did plenty of yelling, I'm sure. <laughs> you did, as did everybody at the time. <laughs> and, and this was right when the Air Force was going through its whole, like, we need to be, we need to transform ourselves into the, the kinder, softer Air Force and get rid of a, a lot of the hazing stuff. And so one semester, you know, my first semester in FTP, my head is being chewed off, you know, every, by, by three different cadets who don't know anything more than I do, right? Yeah, yep. <laughs> but <laughs> their responsibility is to get me ready for field training. And then we get policy that comes down that says we can't do that stuff anymore. No more yelling, right? No more maltraining. And the very next semester, it was crickets. Yep. It was weird. It was. It was weird. So weird. <laughs> I remember Major Drolet got mad at me because I was the honor guard commander and I was yelling. I was literally across the gym and one of the guys was dipping the flag and it was touching the ground and I was yelling at him so he could hear me. I wasn't yelling at him because I was angry at him, yeah. but I'm telling him with an elevated voice to get the flag off the ground. And Drolet pulled me aside and he's like, Hey man, we can't, we can't do that. You can't, you can't yell at him like that. I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't think I was like, I wasn't yelling at him because I was like being mean. Yeah. I was, trying so he could hear me to get the flag off the ground. But yeah, that's like the type of memories that I have from that time where it switched. And it was like before semester prior, I could have screamed at him and right in his face and nobody would have said anything. Yeah. And, and you did. <laughs> <laughs> and we and, made people cry sometimes. I felt bad. Yeah. No, I remember all that. It was good times. I don't want to belabor the ROTC thing you know, too much. You know, we talked about it here on the podcast before. The way that it operates now is very different from the way it was then. But even so, I want to give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about, you know, maybe some of the highlights, some of the lowlights, some of your experience from when you were in ROTC that you have then been able to carry over into your time as an officer and how it kind of like prepared you for what you've been doing after. Yeah, I think ROTC gets kind of a bad rap. And I say that because people are like, oh, you know, we crammed 60 days of training into four years and <laughs> yep. they kind of joke on it like, hey, it's a waste of everybody's time. It takes forever to learn this. But I really enjoyed ROTC. I felt like it gave me a better purpose through college than just like, hey, go learn a bunch of stuff. Like I was focused on, you know, the reason I wanted to get a degree was so I could be an officer, not because I necessarily wanted a degree. And by the way, I swapped my major to history. So I did history as my undergrad and got picked up for that scholarship again. So awesome. I ended up being just fine. But so for me, it was, it was a blast. That's what I looked forward to was going to ROTC and, and learning and growing and getting in better shape and things like that. And I would say some of the highlights were definitely the people. I felt like I was really blessed to have really great people, both above and below in, in year groups. We just had a really solid core of people. And, you know, when I first joined in, I think it was 2005, uh, we had 250 plus people at the detachment. I don't know what they're at now. 
I assume it's quite a bit lower. 170-ish. Okay, that's about where we were. We I think we were 180, 185 my last year. So it's it seems like it's kind of held steady there. But it's still one of the larger detachments. Yeah. And so I really enjoyed it. I would say probably one of my favorite memories ever was the POW MIA thing. And I don't want to divulge too much. I don't know if you guys still do it. But where we really focused on, you know, the prisoners of war, we're learning the code of conduct, we're talking about those types of things. I really enjoyed that. And then there were just a lot of, uh, I enjoyed the drill and ceremonies, strangely. I ended up being like the wing IG my last semester there in charge of drill and ceremonies. And I enjoyed it. I don't know why. I can be really loud sometimes. So I was good at marching. (laughs) And I just really enjoyed it. The camaraderie that you built and just getting to, you know, be around people of like mind that were interested in achieving, you know, a similar goal. I enjoyed that. I would say the things that I probably didn't love the most were kind of in line with probably what would match with most. It was all hazing. My first first year was pretty cush because they don't want to scare you off. On your FTP year, man, they came after us pretty hot and heavy. And uh, we had some pretty fun folks in there that would get up on you. And I mean, I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it either. Right. But overall, I would say 95% positive experience for me. I really enjoyed most of it. Yeah. And you mentioned the people, those are our relationships that we've all carried over into our active duty time. You know, we cross paths with each other on a regular basis and we make those connections. We stay in contact with each other online. We share our stories. We help each other as we continue to grow and develop together. And that's really what comes out of our commissioning sources. Yes, there's some training that takes place that gets you in the mindset of being an officer, but really it's about helping you to understand other people and work with them so that you can carry those skills into the Air Force and use that on behalf of accomplishing the mission, using that network to make things actually take place and happen, right? Yeah. I also think that a good positive thing from it was, especially your first two years, that's kind of your chance to learn what it's like to be a follower, like lowest man on the totem pole, right? So I'm not going to say it's comparable necessarily to like, hey, this is your enlisted time, but you get a little bit of an appreciation for like, hey, I'm the kid that doesn't know anything and I need to be a sponge and I need to have a good attitude and things like that. So I thought that was really good. And then, you know, you never learn anything better than when you have to teach it. So even though we didn't know what we were doing as third and fourth year cadets about the actual Air Force, you were still forced to, you know, kind of learn a little bit about leadership in general and, and general principles. So I thought that was good too. Awesome. Yeah, very good. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about how you went from ROTC into being an air battle manager. You identified early on, as we said at the beginning of this podcast, that you wanted to be an air battle manager, but what was the actual process for you to get selected for that? So I still had to take, you know, the normal rated stuff. I didn't have to do, because I didn't want to be a pilot, I didn't have to do that weird video game. I can't remember what it's even called. Um, (laughs) Test of basic aviation skills. Oh, yeah. I didn't have to do that. But um, really, all you had to do was say, hey, I want to be an air battle manager. You needed to have, to get a rated slot, what they would tell you, and I don't know, you know, the truth necessarily uh, behind it, but they said, you know, you want to do pretty well at field training, get a top third at field training, and do decent so that you can get a rated slot because they're competitive. However, one of the things I knew was that the only place that commissioned more rated individuals than BYU at the time was the academy. So I knew I had a good shot to go to BYU. It's one of the reasons I wanted to go there. Yeah. And so I kind of did my research and was like, hey, this seems like a good spot where I could do it. Uh, Plus, it meets, you know, a lot of my ideals that I would have for going to school. So I was good there. And really, I just self-identified as, hey, I want to go do this. And it, it really wasn't anything more than that, to be honest. When you submitted your preferences, because when you volunteer for rated, you volunteer for all of them, not just one of them. Did you put down, I mean, I'm assuming that you put down air battle manager as your number one. Correct. Did you say anything about being willing to accept pilot or navigator? I have no memory of that. I feel like I didn't. Okay. I knew that I was not going to get pilot just based on my eyesight. I was DQ'd unless I got surgery. So I knew that one was out. Okay. And I can't remember if I qualified for nav based on eyesight because you still have to have a decent level of eyesight for nav and i think it's slightly lower i could be wrong for abm but i wasn't worried about getting nav i really didn't think i was going to get it at all because more people wanted to be a nav than wanted to be an abm so i figured i was good 
Yeah. And that's kind of the thing that I've noticed over the course of my time as a officer just in general, but also being cadre at the detachment. There really isn't that many people that want to be an air battle manager. And so I don't know, would you say that it's a super competitive thing or is it one of those things that if you self-identify that this is what you want, you're qualified for it, you're probably going to get it. You'll probably get it. And the reason is because it's critically undermanned. Okay. We're, we've been undermanned for years. And just like the pilot shortage, we have a shortage in our community. It's not quite to the crisis level that the pilot shortage is, but it's pretty significant. So we, sessions wise, like a sessions can't keep up with our demand right now. Okay. Like we cannot assess more people than we can actually train right now. So trying to up the sessions game is, is a big part of why I'm also interested in doing this is hopefully, you know, we get some information out there and people go, oh, I can, you know, Google air battle manager. What is it? And come up with, you know, Colin Slade's podcast and I can go on here and, and at least get a general idea. Cause I mean, nobody could tell me anything. Right. Like anything. Yeah. Okay. So somebody wants to become an air battle manager. We assume that they're medically qualified. They self-identify for it. We assume that they get selected for it either through ROTC, through Air Force Academy, through OTS. What happens from the time that you're selected to the time that you get to actually pin on wings? Like you guys wear wings, right? Correct. So what does that all look like? What is that process? Yeah, so it's different than when I actually came through. It's a little bit different now. You get wings out of the schoolhouse. Okay. And just for clarification, I'm an assistant director of operations at the schoolhouse right now. It's the only ABM schoolhouse in the Air Force. Okay. It's located at Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida. If you like the beach, it's a pretty good place to be. So there's a lot of that good stuff going on. Hurricane Michael kind of messed the place up, but the ABM schoolhouse was the one constant. We were back up and running super fast. Uh, I was going to say, you know, Tyndall's so nice because everything's new there, but apparently not for the ABM. <laughs> it's going to be brand new. <laughs> it's going to be brand new, uh, including a new facility for the ABM schoolhouse, which is going to be pretty uh, legit. So okay. essentially what happens is you'll show up to Tyndall and most students sit casual status for a month or two. Typically about a month from when you get there is when you're likely to start class. It could be two months, could be three, depending on several factors we can only accept so many people in a class at a time. Okay. And right now it's been trimmed down. It's now a six and a half month course for undergrad. And it's broken up into a pretty good chunk. There's essentially nine blocks of training that you go through. If you want, I can run through them real quick and just kind of recap kind of like what happens in each phase of training. Yeah. I won't eat up too much of your time, but essentially you get there and it's like, Hey, intro, what are you expected to do? Here's kind of like the groundwork of what you're going to be going through for the next six months. Here's what an ABM is. Here's the places that you can be assigned. So just general information and aviation training, like, Hey, here's information on aircraft, a little bit of that. So you get a little bit of flavor of what's a pitot tube and what do all these things do and, and things like that. So that's kind of the first block. And then you quickly move on after like four or five training days to block two, and that's your academic heavy section. So it's like, hey, this is an AWACS. Here's a lecture on that. And you get interaction with, you know, instructors that have been on an AWACS that have flown on an AWACS that come tell you what it's like. Same with the J stars, same with CRC, same with all of the different platforms that we kind of interact with, as well as the theater air control system, theater air ground system, all that, what's the air operations center. So you get super academic heavy, There's a couple tests in that block, and then you move on to block three, which is control fundamentals. And essentially in control fundamentals, I remember being told, hey, you're going to control aircraft. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you mean I'm going to have a headset on, I'm going to talk to a pilot in an aircraft and like provide information to him so that he can do his job. Oh, okay. That makes a little more sense. So when we talk aircraft control, there's a lot of different types of control. Yeah. But Essentially, aircraft control is interfacing with pilots of many different airframes and helping them get from point A to point B and interface with everything they need to do so that they can accomplish their mission. Yeah. So let me just pause you right there. When you talk control, we're talking about like the second half of command and control. Correct. Okay. Which is one of the five fundamental missions of the Air Force that we provide command and control for the battle space. Correct. Primarily in the air domain, but sometimes we also will provide control for what's going on in the ground fight. Correct. So yeah, with command and control as an ABM, initially you're going to execute at the tactical level of control. So we're TAC C2 or tactical command and control. That's what we do. That's our bread and butter uh, from that tactical standpoint. And you know, as you get on up, you'll get into operational and strategic over the course of your career. Right. 
but tactical control is what we provide initially. So control fundamentals block is literally, hey, I have a headset on, I talk, and it's all simulation events at this point. You're not talking to live aircraft yet because you'd freak out and, <laughs> and be scared. And so some of it is kind of like, hey, how do I vector an aircraft? What's a compass rose? 360 degrees, how do I tell somebody to go left 270? Yeah. How do I hook them up to a tanker? How do I point them out from point A to point B? How do I get them here? What methods are there for me to talk to an aircraft? Manipulate my controls because you start to interface with the control system that you're going to learn, your weapon system. And so that's what that block is all about. Then you go to the classified block where it's the Intel portion, where you get all of the like red fighters, red systems that we go up against. You know, what are the countries that have these type of systems? What am I learning here? Surface to air missiles, you know, red aircraft, things like that. And then you're also going to get some blue fighters in there. And I think they still have some gray fighters in there, not 100% sure. But that's the Intel block. You'll take a classified test there. And that one's really interesting because it's kind of your first exposure to the secret realm and what do I get to learn? So you spend a lot of time in the vault, <laughs> a lot of time studying, learning things there. Yeah. And then block five is where we kind of start to throw some fun stuff at you. Not fun, like it's been fun up to this point, but where you get to control live aircraft. Yeah. And you're going to do air to ground stuff for block five. And it's pretty cool because of the way that ABMs shred out, there's a lot of different things that you can end up doing in the course of your career. But air to ground is a huge part of what we do, where we have an airspace and we have to get aircraft from point A to point B so they can drop bombs on this person over here or, you know, go do a strike over here or investigate this point over here. And so it's learning the fundamentals of airspace control. Yeah. I have airspace control measures. I have ROSs, restricted operation zones. I have all sorts of different things that kind of pop up and I need to pair the correct asset to the right place. Can this aircraft go do this type of tasking over here. Yeah. So that's really fun and it's really challenging. Um, I think with the new syllabus that's coming out, you're not actually going to control live aircraft there yet. We're going to push that to block six, but in block six, that's your air to air control. That's where you first get your air to air control. And we call the, uh, the airplanes are called decafs because they're, <laughs> they, they don't have as much zip as an actual <laughs> pointy nose fighter. Okay. <laughs> they go pretty slow. They're contract <laughs> aircraft, but it's perfect pace for an ABM student to learn how to talk to a live aircraft, learn control fundamentals, learn a timeline. And when I say a timeline, each MDS or mission design series, which is a fancy way of saying aircraft type, has its own timeline, which you owe certain calls at certain points to those aircraft to help keep them on point. Yeah. And this is where you get to make picture calls for the first time, which is a lot of fun. And essentially imagine a lot of times ABMs are called like the fifth wingman. So if you're in a four ship, a flight of four, the guy, all these pilots have soda straws as far as their radar. They can only see a little bit at a time. And the ABM has a big radar yeah, and they can see the entire airspace, you know, for what it's worth. And that big radar is on top of the AWACS. Exactly. Yeah, literally a big, it's really, really big a, radar. A really big rotating dome on top of the AWACS or on the ground with the CRC. And then the JSTARS has its own different type of radar that doesn't do air to air. But they'll come to me and they'll say doghouse, which is the call sign of our unit here at Tyndall. So doghouse picture, tell me what's out there, you know, what exists. And then the students have to see what's out there, measure it appropriately, and communicate it in accordance with our control standards. So there's a very specific way to talk. It might be yeah. you know, three group champagne, 15 wide, 10 deep, track east, weighted north. Like, and you have to tell them, it's almost like you're painting a picture with words to the pilot, hey, what's out there? Right. And then they go, okay, I'm going to target over here, and I'm going to target this one over here. And the ABM is correlating, hey, are they targeting the correct group that they're supposed to? Do they know how many contacts there are? Is there an altitude differentiation or a stack over in this group? And so it becomes a lot of putting it all together in the air-to-air -air realm, Yep. but at a much slower pace than what you get out in the combat air forces with the CAF. So that one's a pretty fun phase. Some people really enjoy that one, and it's a lot of fun before they then go into the high-performance sim phase, which is where now they get taught the classified timelines for all of the different MDSs or aircraft types they're going to control. So, yeah. you know, you're going to get F-15s, the Charlie models. You're going to get F-16s a little bit. You're going to get F-35s, F-22s. And you learn how each of those timelines work for each aircraft, how you communicate to each type, all that stuff. And we ramp it up significantly. Yeah. So you start getting pretty fast and heavy as far as how you control. And... I remember being told like, hey, you're going to control. And I'm like, well, how do I tell an aircraft where another aircraft is? Like, how do I do that? Yeah. And essentially, we choose a fixed point in space that everyone agrees upon with coordinates. And that's called a bullseye. Yeah. And so I would tell you that 
this group, single group bullseye, 270, 25, 25,000, hot, hostile, two contacts. And so that's telling you on a compass rose from this fixed point at bearing 270 at 25 miles away from that point, there's an aircraft at this many thousands of feet doing this, and there's this many of them. Yeah. And so they spend a lot of time learning all of the different types of communication standards uh, to talk to fighter pilots and their different timelines. And then they move on to block eight, which is the live fighter block, where they are now going to take all those skills, but they're going to do it in the live environment with actual fighter squadrons. Yep. And we pipe in dozens of radars across the East Coast. So we can control, today I controlled some fighters up out of uh, Seymour Johnson. Okay. Up on the East Coast. So from Tyndall. And we talk with all these different fighter squadrons and control their missions that they do. They call us up, hey, Doghouse, can you give us control today? Yep, sure, we'll hook you up. And then the students go and they control there and they see, oh, real radios are a lot worse than <laughs> sim radios. <laughs> right. Where I can hear everything crystal clear. Now I go into the live environment and it's really hard to hear. And oh gosh, you know, real pilots do real pilot things and they, <laughs> they're a lot tougher to deal with. Like, um, so oh, it's come really on, good pilots experience. are so easy to work um, with. They, <laughs> they don't have a mind of their own. They just do whatever they're told. It's so funny the first time, you know, students get to control the live high performance aircraft because it just kind of blows their mind a little bit with how different it is from the sim. Right. And so that's great. They'll get four chances to do that. You'll control four times there. And then the final portion of UABMT is crew control. So it's a crew coordination event where instead of controlling as an individual where I'm talking to aircraft, it's an entire crew. So the entire class, which is typically we can, right now we do a 12 students per class if we can get that many. So you'd be in your class of 12 and essentially you're going to work together several students at a time in a much larger force. Like maybe it's a DCA scenario, defensive counter air scenario, you know, to deter Russian aggression, or you've got a much larger, like almost like a war that's going on. Yeah. And you get to deal with it on a much grander scale and see how you work together. So the intent is not, hey, go control a perfect air war. It's how do I coordinate inside my crew and off board to make sure that we're all kind of on the same sheet of music. Right. And then you get to graduate. And that's when you get to pin on your wings is at the end of your six and a half months of uh, very hard, very tough, lots of fun work then you get to pin your wings on. And a few months before that, you get shredded out and you get kind of your call sign night and told where you're going to go. So, and I can kind of cover what your options are here in a sec if you'd like. Yeah. So I just want to jump back and touch upon a couple things. So while students are going through this, they have not yet been awarded the 13 Bravo AFSC. They are, I mean, are they considered student pilots? I think they're 92 tangos if you're looking at it for the actual designation. I think it's 92 Tango, where it's just student ABM. Okay, student ABM. You said 12 at a time, if you can get that many. So you don't usually get that many? We, we typically do. Um, there can be bumps like, hey, the end of the fiscal year, or just depending on sessions itself. Like, did we get them all within the time frame required for us to have a 12 ship? We can support a 12 ship right now for pretty much every class. Some of them end up being an eight ship. My class was an eight ship. But there is talk about potentially getting up to 16 per class. Who knows? So we're ready to absorb that many. But right now, it's pretty much 12 per class. Okay. And then how often do each of these classes start? And then how long are each of these different blocks? So there's a class that graduates slash starts every three weeks. Okay. So it's a lot. And they come through in waves and each block is completely different. So training day wise, I'm trying to remember how many total training days you'd think I would know this. The syllabus is, but it sounds like, oh, that's not that many training days. Like I think if there's like maybe 17 in the air to the first air to air block, but that means we allocate that many because when you're dealing with live aircraft, weather is going to cancel you right. half the time, right? Maintenance is going to cause a problem. They can't take off today or X, Y, Z happens. So the training days are allotted in there to make sure that we can graduate people on time. Right. But each block is completely different. Some are a couple of days, some are a couple of weeks. So LFE slash integrated crew event, which is what it's going to be called here shortly. That final block is about a month. Okay. And then is it one of those things where if a student doesn't pass a certain block, they recycle back to the start of that same block? Or do they get like three strikes and they're out? Or how does it work? What is the, the washout rate? You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, I mean, typically, if somebody struggles, there's a couple options that are kind of out there for them. 
there are certain standards like, hey, you can, you know, student non-progression is what a failure is called. So you can SNP so many events before non-progression, student non-progression. Because um, failure is too harsh. <laughs> <laughs> Now it's just the official term. I don't know. It's always been that way. It's okay. kind of funny. But if you you know fail or SMP so many events, then you go to a progress check. You go to an elimination check, so that the commander you know can chat with you. He has a lot of options in front of him. So there are a lot of options there for us. And some people just it's not for everybody, right? Not everybody's going to take to it. It does take a certain skill set, right? So I'm not going to pretend everybody makes it through because there is an attrition rate here. It's not super like heavy on the attrition rate, but it's a decent amount. You're going to whittle away several people that just go, oh man, like I just don't have the skill set for this. It's just, I'm not taken to it. Yeah. And then of course, you know, there's always an option like anywhere where you can self-eliminate, which comes with certain ramifications. So, you know, people need to be aware of that as well, along with any training, right? In the Air Force. So right, lots of options out there. Okay. So let's say that you're one of those people that does manage to get through. You do have the aptitude. You enjoy the the academics. You excel in the practical and the sims and the live control events. What happens from there after you graduate and get your wings? You're now a 13 Bravo air battle manager ready to go take on the world and choreograph the air war, right? What happens next? So there's a couple options from the schoolhouse, basically two options. So we also train guard and reserve folks that come to us and then they go back to their unit. So okay, those are kind of the one-offs, the special ones that aren't going to go out to the CAF. For the individuals that are going to go out to the CAF, there are certain locations that they can go and certain airframes they can go. So the Air Force is paying you to be a rated officer. You're getting flight pay. So they want air under your butt for a good chunk of time. So right. they shred you out to an airframe and you get your call sign night and know where you're going to go probably a month and a half to two months before you graduate. So it's not necessarily a secret until you get your wings. And what they are is you can essentially track to the E3 Sentry or the AWACS, the 707 Boeing with the spinning dome on top that everybody's seen on Transformers. <laughs> <laughs> and that the main, like the mothership is Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma. I think that's where like 85% of all our airframe tails for the AWACS exists. So you can go there. And that's honestly where a good number of the folks are gonna go. They do primarily air-to-air styled control, but they also train and do all of the air-to-ground stuff that you learn at the schoolhouse as well. So it's broad mission set. AWACS can do a lot. JSTARS is a little bit more specific. They're also a modified 707 Boeing, but they've got that little canoe-looking radar on the bottom. They have moving target indicators. So they track folks on the ground, right? and they can say, oh, hey, that looks like it's a convoy over here. And so they have a really cool mission I am admittedly less familiar with their mission because I have not flown on that aircraft, but I have dozens of friends and I've heard nothing but good things. Everybody that goes to Georgia, Robbins Air Force Base, Georgia seems to enjoy it. And they have a really cool mission. So those are your two main airframes. From there, you can also go directly from the schoolhouse to Kadena Air Force Base in Okinawa, Japan. Okay. That is an AWACS billet. There's far fewer that go there, but it is an option. You can also go to Elmendorf Air Force Base, Joint Base Elmendorf Richardson in Alaska. And that one's pretty cool in Anchorage, Alaska. So you could go there. Also, about as many people go there as do to Kadena. That is also an AWACS mission. And then you can actually also go to Geilenkirchen Air Base in Germany. NATO. Which is a NATO assignment, correct? And it is not an Air Force, U.S. Air Force E3. It is a NATO E3. So they okay. do have a significantly different setup inside. I'm going to say they're probably not as up to date as the U.S. Air Force because our Air Force puts more money into it, right? But you get to work with all the NATO countries there. And I've been to GK. It's a really cool base, really neat opportunity to get to work with NATO partners there. And then that's pretty much your option coming out of the schoolhouse. Okay. So again, if I were to put a number to it, I'd say probably 10% could go to Georgia to the J Stars, probably 75% to tinker just because it's a much bigger base right far more abms that have to go there to feed the beast so i did five and a half years at tinker myself and there's far worse places to be so those are your general shred outs that you're going to do and then from there there's other options like i can eventually get to it but i did a tour in the crc which was really cool 
And that's kind of the ground station. Yeah, you've said CRC a couple of times. You <laughs> haven't told us what it means. So please define that for the layperson such as me that has no clue what you're talking about. It's not going to help. It's called the Control and Reporting Center. Okay. So yeah. I'm sure that clarifies everything. <laughs> um, it's essentially the ground-based version of an AWACS in the sense that you have host radars that are owned and run by the CRC. There's an entire contingent of not only operations personnel, so you have 13 Bravos as the officer control personnel, Taxi 2. Then you have the enlisted controllers, which are one Charlie Fives with a Delta shred out. Yep. And they are the enlisted controllers. So they focus on controlling aircraft. That's like their main baby. And then outside of ops, you have, holy smokes, a lot. We had 23 AFSCs just in our squadron at the CRC. And you're talking radar maintenance. You're talking... Oh my gosh, HVAC, Power Pro, vehicle maintenance. So there's dozens, literally dozens of other AFSCs in the squadron there. And it's like a self-sustained squadron where we have all of our equipment. We've got two radars that we can go deploy wherever. And if you think of it like an air war kicks off, right? AWACS is going to get there quick. Yeah. They're a flying platform. Yep. However, the CRC, give us a couple of days notice. We'll pack everything up. We'll drive everything out, whether it's on five-ton trucks or we'll load it onto a C-17. We'll fly into that location. We'll get set up. As long as we have logistical support, once we're set up, we can stick around 24-7. So you don't have the limitations that you do with an AWACS airframe where it's like, hey, I can only stay airborne for this long, then I got to go yeah. and get another AWACS on station. So kind of think persistent long-term TAC C-2 versus the shorter quicker to get their taxi to of the AWACS. Yeah, and the CRC being the field deployable version as well. Correct. Not enduring, but it doesn't have the same limitations like you were saying of having to stay up in the air. Right, and I'm also a big proponent of the CRC because they're so modular. I can configure my crew and add a lot more people into that than the chunk that I'm limited to on an airframe. Like I can't just add an extra console in there and stick another guy down on the airframe, I've, I've got what I've got. Same with radios, I only have so many. Right. CRC, I can drive another truck 214 up there, plug it in, I got more radios. So it's a lot more modular and configurable for whatever mission set you're doing. But I'm also not gonna stick my radars from my CRC off in bad guy land. They're gonna get blown up. Right. So think more point defense, DCA centric, but we still train to all the same mission sets, OCA and all that stuff, because we can also pipe in radars from other places. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's really fascinating. So it sounds like leaving the schoolhouse, there's a wide range of options that a new 13 Bravo can pursue, that they can be assigned to, and then do all of those same options stay on the table as they complete their first and their second assignments? Can they rotate around all of these ones or should they expect that other things are going to take place for them? Like they're gonna have to go uh, do some time at staff or work, maybe get pushed to do some special duty career broadening kind of stuff. What does the career progression look like? So typically you go to your first base and it's going to be probably three years, about a three-year tour. If you go overseas to like Elmo or Kadena, then it's going to be a three-year tour. If you're married, sometimes if you're not married, it's a two-year tour for overseas, but you can absolutely rotate you can go Tinker to Elmo to Kadena to Tinker. If you go to Tinker, you're probably going back to Tinker at some time in the future, just because there's so many ABMs that need to go there to fill billets. Right. That's not to say that you can't not go there. Like I went direct to Tinker. I was there for five and a half years. Then I got selected to go to see a CRC gig in Spangdalem, Germany. We knew that when I got selected to go there, we were going to move the entire squadron down to Italy. So I had 14 months in Germany, seven-ish of which... I was deployed for. And then I came back from deployment three weeks later, we moved everything down to Italy and then set up the squadron there in Aviano, Italy. And that's where the CRC is now that's in, in Europe. There's only one in Europe. But then I came back to the schoolhouse as an instructor. I could go to Tinker when I get out of here. I could go to Elmo out of here. I could even go to JSTARS, even though I've never flown on that platform, I could absolutely get picked up for that. So you can absolutely bounce back and forth, but career progression wise, it's fairly typical where, you know, you're not going to get picked up for staff unless, you know, you're a field grade. Typically, either you get selected for school and it's after you go to school, maybe you get staff, but it's a very small percentage that go to staff these days. They just need people so bad. And with us being a critically, you know, undermanned career field, I'm not saying you can't go to staff, but I wouldn't like, you know, bet the farm on it. 
So you can absolutely go to staff, but that's kind of the typical career progression. I'm going to go do a couple years here, go do a couple years here, go to SOS, get my PDE out, continue to move on, pin on FGO. Maybe you get picked up for school, maybe you do it online, and then potential staff tour, something like that. But high likelihood you go back operationally as well. And because there's so many different crew positions on the jets, they're also different grade based generally. So if you're going to be a mission crew commander or a mission commander on the jet for the AWACS, for instance, that's typically a field grade officer. Okay. Yeah. And going back to what you were saying way back at the beginning about the career field being critically manned, it makes sense that the majority of the time is going to be spent in the operational billets because there's just not enough of you guys to go around. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's fair to say. And again, you know, I hate blanket statements because there's always going to be that one or two people that just somehow magically escape right. any of that. And they're like, oh, it worked for me. It can work for you. But yes, by and large, you're going to spend a large portion of your time in the operational environment, which is great. Like that's our bread and butter. That's what we do. Okay. Very cool. And what is the ADSC, the active duty service commitment for ABMs coming out of the schoolhouse, how long do they have to be in the Air Force before they're given the opportunity to pursue something else? So it's six years from when you get your aeronautical orders. So essentially six years from when you start school. Okay. At the schoolhouse. Okay. So the schoolhouse you mentioned is six and a half ish months, and then they're going to spend the next five and a half years fulfilling that commitment before they can choose to go do something else, right? Correct. Cool. Hey, Colin, I'm really glad you were able to get Hollywood on. And I wanted to start really briefly with just a quick discussion about how different the recruiting environment was when he was trying to join versus what it is right now, because it's so, yeah, so different. So let's think, you know, he was joining ROTC in and around the time of the invasion of Iraq. Right. And forces were growing. There was money. There was space, there was a need. And that time is not now. And I think it's important for our audience to recognize there are geopolitical things that are going to impact their ability to get in or to stay in and how little control they have over those things. Yeah. At the time, there was a little bit of a drawdown in the Air Force, but there was still a need to keep the pipe full and people coming in. But that's a very different thing these days where the Air Force is experiencing a 20-year high in retention because of the uncertainty that surrounds COVID and all of the economic impacts that it's having. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, today is not then. It is a very different environment. Yeah. What are your thoughts? What are the things you kind of wanted to chat about? Well, this kind of goes back to what you said at the beginning of the episode as we were introducing Hollywood is the how big the Air Force is. I mean, it's not the biggest of the branches of the service, but there's still a huge variety of careers and experiences and things that people can be involved in. And often the very, very small corner of ops is this extremely important career field known as air battle management or being an air battle manager. And he alludes to it throughout the interview how this is a critically manned career field. There's not a lot of people that are in it, but there's always a need. And I wanted to revisit that just a little bit more of why is it that it's small? Why is it that it is so critical to what we do as an Air Force? And kind of just start that discussion with this idea of control in general, because I failed to ask Hollywood to define control for the audience in the interview. And so I want to make sure that everybody understands what is meant by control before we continue to discuss why this career field is so important. Yeah. Yeah. Control. It's one of those words that we all know what it means, but when we apply it to this very specific scenario that is combat and the concept of the employment of air power, we actually need to get into the weeds, right? We need to define it. So right. we're going to start with Joint Pub 3 Tech Zero Joint Operations. So we're going right to the purple documents, Colin. We're, we're getting big here. A little light reading for everybody? Yeah, it's only 225 pages. It'll be fine. Um, That's shorter than a Tolkien novel. Yeah, yeah, a whole lot less exciting, promise. <laughs> But nonetheless, really important, right? This is our profession. We need to understand this stuff. And right in the beginning, it defines what command and control is. 
Now, Colin, we've recently talked about command and how important that is and how that's not something that can be delegated. Command is essential. It's a core trait. Can't be automated. Command can't be automated. Can be delegated, but cannot be automated. Sorry, I'm going to correct you there. No, absolutely. You're 100%. So control, and this is straight out of Joint Pub 3 Tech Zero, control is inherent in command. To control is to manage and direct forces and functions consistent with the commander's command authority. That feels super circular, but it's actually quite clean. I think this is a really clean definition. Control is the ability and the authority to manage and direct forces and functions. So when he's talking about controlling aircraft, you know, when I look at this definition, I think about what I understand from their career field. They are directing and managing the forces in accordance with what they understand the commander's intent is. Another thing we may have heard this, and it's something we trained to at OTS, is called mission command. Mm -hmm. Did you talk about this in our OTC, Colin? Yep. Yeah, so mission command is the idea that you can get a pretty concrete direction your commander wants you to go in and a mission to accomplish without the specific details of how to do that. And they expect you, as an officer and a leader, to be able to formulate your path to success. And I hear that in this. Yeah. And yet it's tied to the command, which comes from the commander. Yeah. So my understanding of it is that the controllers that are flying around in the AWACS or that are on the ground in the CRC, they receive that intent from the commander and it is their responsibility to communicate that intent out to the flyers, the air crew, the pilots, and also sometimes the people on the ground in order to achieve that objective, achieve that intent, carry it out through full execution and mission success. It is the responsibility of the controller, the ABM, and those that work with them to, I don't want to say filter, but carry the message from the commander to the people in the field. And if they get that wrong, then uh oh, we're not achieving the intent of the commander and possibly we're going to experience mission failure. So that's my take on it, that that's why this mission of being an ABM and providing control to the battle space is so important. Yeah. What do you think, Reed? No, I think you're hitting it on the head. If you think about it, Colin, what is a commission if not carrying the message of the Constitution as delegated by the president? Well, you just gave me chills. Right? That is the responsibility of a leader and of a commander and of a commissioned officer is to carry that message. And command and control, you outlined it. It's one of the core missions of the United States Air Force. And these ABMers are absolute pros. I worked with an ABMer at OTS. He was one of my fellow instructors. And we were talking ops. We were shooting the watch, you know, talking about operations we had been a part of and just like Hollywood did he starts getting into that like threat call speak yeah. and just the hairs on the back of your neck stand <laughs> up and you're like yeah get some it's time you know like <laughs> it gets in you once you've been in ops and you feel it and boy they're total professionals yeah and they are total professionals they're that capable because of how UABMT is set up and you could hear it in his voice and the way that he explained everything and my takeaway from that was, man, this is so technical. Just the explanation of the blocks themselves and the training that they're going to go through is extremely technical, far more technical than anything that I did going through my initial training as a civil engineer. And it just got me to thinking about how important it is to go through this kind of technical training at the outset of your officer experience, your military experience. And that's just across the board, but how much more important it is for something as critical as control, but also something as niche as control is. I mean, I, I don't know that there's anything else out there in the civilian world, in the corporate space that approximates what our controllers are doing as they're carrying that message and helping us to organize the battle space and carry out the mission. Yeah, it certainly is a, a unique thing. Yeah, there's got to be something out there, you know, maybe somebody on a stock market floor, you know, interpreting a ton of data and communicating 
an auctioneer. Yeah, uh, you know, I, there's a. Bu- I'm sure there's something out there. You know, and our audience, can, you know, fill us in. I think the uniqueness, especially, lies in the fact that it's in the profession of arms and the gravity of getting it wrong. Yeah. Right. I remember at officer training school a lesson we taught about how some ABMers had given threat calls that ended up in the shooting down of an army, United States Army aircraft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not a good day. You know, that's the stakes that these guys are playing with. And yeah, absolutely amazing folks. Yeah, you can definitely hear it in Hollywood's voice. You can hear it in his passion for the career field that spanned not just his time in the military, but also even before that. You know, we talked about how he wanted to be an ABM from the very, very beginning and has just carried that torch and that excitement all the way through until today. And what a fantastic opportunity it is to hear from him, have him share you know, some of his experiences and the importance of this career field for the rest of us. Fortunately, this is not the last time you're going to hear from him. Like I said in the intro to this episode, we're going to bring him back and finish this interview next week. So invite you all to continue to listen in and learn some more about the air battle management career field and get into some of the more theoretical things around what it means to be an air battle manager and an officer in the Air Force. Yep. Absolutely looking forward to it. Anything else before we wrap up this week, Colin? No, we'll leave it there. Awesome. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Commission Ed.